Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen McLeod, and I'm Mount Vernon's Director of Library Programs here at the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington. I'm thrilled to welcome you all to this special live stream event, which we're hosting in partnership with our good friends at the National Society Daughters of the American Revolution. For those of you who might be visiting uh, this Mount Vernon digital platform for the first time, we welcome you to take some time, uh, visit our website at uh, mountvernon.org, and we hope that you'll discover uh, so many of the, the interesting things that we have to offer over our comprehensive website. Like the DAR, the home of George Washington is owned and operated by an all-female organization, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. And we both, both organizations share a mission which is fo focused on education and historic preservation. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about a topic that uh, is of great personal interest to me, and that is genealogy. Uh, many of you probably know this already, but it's worth mentioning that genealogy is actually the second most popular hobby or pastime in our nation. Uh, it's a billion dollar industry that has spawned profitable uh, websites, television shows, scores of books, and a new industry of DNA testing. I'm joined tonight by Ali Golan. Uh, who is the National Chair for Lineage Research at the Daughters of the American Revolution. Uh, Allie is a 10-year member of the DAR who has proven her descent from no less than 30 patriots who rendered aid to the cause of the Revolutionary War. She's also, she also descends from two passenger, passengers from the famous Mayflower and serves in various capacities for multiple lineage societies. Professionally, Allie is the managing director for a software company that creates business simulations. Uh, a former educator, she is a recognized expert in learning style theory and is the author of several books on the subject. She joins us tonight from her home near Denver, Colorado, to discuss ways in which the DAR can help you, our audience, discover your patriot ancestors. So, Allie, welcome, uh, and why don't we just dive right in, and I'd like to ask you if you can give us a general overview of what the DAR is all about. You bet. Thank you so much, Stephen. I appreciate the invitation to join you tonight and uh, the opportunity to speak. So thank you so much. Um, let's jump right in. So DAR, or Daughters of the American Revolution, is a nonprofit, non-religious, and non-political women's service organization of 190,000 members serving the communities in which we live. You'll find DAR members providing enhanced educational opportunities for children, supporting our nation's veterans, and honoring our first responders and active military. Our motto is God, home, and country. And we strive to honor these through work in our three pillars. The first is historic preservation, including restoring and maintaining historical sites, uh, marking Revolutionary War Patriot grave sites, placing monuments around the world to memorialize people and events throughout American history, and preserving genealogical records, artifacts, and historical documents. Our second pillar is education, including supporting five schools and providing scholarships and funds to American Indian children in schools, uh, additional scholarships to outstanding students throughout the country, sponsoring history essay contests, and much more. And finally, patriotism, for which DAR members donate hundreds of thousands of hours every year to veterans, participation in naturalization ceremonies, uh, presenting patriotic awards to deserving individuals, and we offer support to America's service personnel in current conflicts through care packages, phone cards, and other needed items. We have nearly 3,000 chapters across the U.S. and in 12 other countries, and annually we provide millions of hours of volunteer service to various efforts in our communities. This is fascinating. Um, can you give me an idea of why a woman in today's world would want to be a member of the DAR? Yeah, you bet. So in addition to camaraderie and service to our communities, Joining DAR allows women to preserve their family's history, um, allows us to honor the role our ancestors played in gaining our nation's independence. Membership provides an opportunity to connect with women of all ages and backgrounds in our communities. We have great opportunities for leadership development at the local, state, and national levels. And for the genealogists among us, membership in DAR offers greater access to the society's repository of information. Plus, there's a great deal of pride in being a part owner in one of the largest complexes of buildings owned exclusively by women in the world. Let me know, let us all know who's actually eligible to be a member of the DAR. Yep, you bet. So any woman 18 years or older who can provide 
direct lineal descent proof of that from an ancestor who supported the cause in gaining Americans' independence. And there's a wide range of activities that qualify as having supported the cause. So there's the obvious activity of having served in a military capacity, fighting against the British, of course, as long as that military service occurred between the Battle of Lexington and the date that the British evacuated New York City. But there are also acts of civil service. Uh, this would include serving in local and state government roles, like a justice of the peace, a town clerk, a judge, a sheriff, uh, many more roles that DAR recognizes as having supported the cause. And there were acts of patriotic service. This would include serving on a committee that was made necessary by the war, signing an oath of allegiance, uh, which in some areas was required to obtain a land grant, um, also doctors and nurses and others who aided the American wounded. There were a series of requisitions to raise money for the war that resulted in supply taxes. So if your ancestor, even if they were pacifists like the Quakers, if they owned land and paid supply tax, thank you for your service. And this is how some DAR members are able to prove they're female patriots, because while the women acted as spies, nursed the wounded, certainly supported the cause in many, many ways, they weren't generally compensated and their service can be difficult to prove. But if they'd been widowed, they could own land and they paid a supply tax that helped to fund the army. Um, how does one go about discovering who actually, if they actually have a patriot in their family tree? Yeah, good question. So we have a vast range of resources I would place into two buckets, really. We have public resources that include our physical library, uh, many online collections, and several databases that are unique to DAR. And we have DAR volunteers who serve at the chapter, state, and national levels in numerous capacities and in ways that help prospective members identify their patriot ancestors as well as the lineage to those ancestors. So if you want, I'll take a deep dive here and we'll start with the public resources. As you had mentioned, um, genealogy has grown in popularity to become the number two hobby in America after gardening. <laughs> and there are great online resources like Ancestry.com and Family Search, but users beware. A lot of the data and links that you find from others are good clues, but not always solid proof. One source for discovering proof of your ancestry is the DAR library. The library was founded in 1896 and is celebrating its 125th year. The extensive collection is focused on the revolutionary period. Um, we've got open shelving collections and a few items that require even gloved hands assistance to, to let you see those. The books are organized by state and then the counties within that state and by family. The, the library features an extensive manuscript and file collection. The collection is, is vast and it includes print materials uh, such as the 34,000 plus families collection, nearly 120,000 items in the states and regions collection, and almost 35,000 other items. There are hundreds of microfiches with valuable Revolutionary War and genealogical information and nearly 21,000 microfilm items. Our digital materials collection includes nearly 20,000 items, and this would include things like cemetery headstone transcriptions, Bible records, uh, much, much more. And we are delighted to announce that visitors from far and wide are invited to visit our spectacular library after our reopening. This depends, of course, on the status of the pandemic in Washington, DC, but on September 1st, we do hope to reopen our library. For those who can't visit the library in person, uh, we have a wide range of DAR resources available online, including an online catalog of the DAR library. So from dar.org, you would hover over the library tab shown here in red and click the library catalog. From here, you can search for items you wish to review when you can visit in person. Uh, and also you can find links to the online resources uh, as in this example. So I've, I've searched for work projects and here it's telling me that I have 95 records existing here. If I click this link, it's returned several results, some of which link to external sites where the document can actually be reviewed online. If we go back to the page, the homepage of dar.org and hover over that library tab to reveal this drop-down menu, you can see a wide range of resources available from the Genealogical Research System, or GRS, through some of the examples of what you might find. So the GRS includes the applications and supporting documentation of our members and can be searched in three ways, by ancestor, by DAR member, 
and by lineal descendants of the Patriot ancestor. These databases are exclusive to DAR and they contain the data we've collected since our founding in 1890. So let's talk about the ancestor tab first. This is a database of the 150,000 ancestors that DAR currently has approved. If you have a hunch that your ancestor was in the right place at the right time to have supported the cause, your first step might be to search for his or her name in this ancestor database. While you need to search data into at least one of these fields, you wanna refrain from entering too much data unless you're 100% certain about it. In other words, if you put a birth year in, you might get a return that would not include your ancestor if you weren't 100% certain of that birth year. You might miss finding your ancestor altogether. Also, you wanna try and find um, alternate spellings of last names. So spelling was not as standardized as it is today, and it may have changed over the generations. But let's take an example. Let's assume your ancestor was Henry Rhodes. Typing just the first and last names has returned the following four entries. There's a Henry Rhodes in North Carolina, another in Pennsylvania, yet another from North Carolina, and a fourth also from Pennsylvania. Let's assume you're pretty confident that your Henry Rhodes lived in and served from Pennsylvania, and you think he might be this Henry Rhodes who was born in Germany. The first thing you might notice is this note in red type that problems have been discovered with at least one previously verified app. If we dig a little deeper and we can learn a lot from this. So we click this Henry Rhodes name, we see his whole record. And that would include these comments pertaining to that alert. Specifically, there's an er error in the lineage. It's noted as EL. And it has to do with Daniel's second wife, Mary Polly Kimberly. As we scroll down the page, we see a list of every DAR member who has joined through this ancestor as well as the child of Henry Rhodes his or her, and his or her spouse through whom those members descended. Farther down the page, we see two DAR members who joined through Henry's son, Daniel, and note that EL, error in lineage, notations are here. So recall that the alert was that Daniel's second wife was the mother of Andrew and Daniel. If you're not descended from Andrew or Daniel, this alert does not affect you. And even if you did descend from Andrew or Daniel, this note is just to alert you who their mother was. The ancestor and his record are still valid and you may join DAR through this Patriot. As you search various ancestors in that DAR database, you might find a variety of codes and their corresponding alerts. They appear in red text. These are due largely to changing standards in genealogy research. And because of the high standards of, for accuracy, these codes have been developed to ensure the lineage and research are accurate for that Patriot. So I think we'll take a moment and review some of the codes and their varying levels of cause for concern for researchers. There are two categories I would place these in, ancestor codes and ancestor child codes. Not every code is inherently a showstopper uh, as far as the Patriot service or a researcher's lineage to that Patriot. But here's some that maybe warrant closer inspection. So from those examples I just showed, FAMPCS is <laughs> future applicants must prove correct service. And this indicates that the proof of service that was used to establish this person as a patriot is no longer valid. So if this is your ancestor, you're gonna to have to find proof of service. It doesn't necessarily have to be proof of the service originally attributed to the ancestor, but it has to meet today's standards of proof. FAMPC is future applicants must prove correct lineage of child. And this indicates there's a problem with a previously verified lineage of one child of the Patriot, but lines through other children may be just fine and it may be solvable still. TRNWAN is treat as a new ancestor. This typically means that no one has proven the service or lineage since DAR's earliest days. And now everything, the service and the lineage must be documented. MOB or more on back, refers to a time when there literally, was literally additional information about an ancestor on the back of a card. This is our pre-digital days. It doesn't mean there's a problem. It just means that um, there's more information for the researcher. Uh, it can often be found in the comments area in the database. We saw this one before, the error in lineage. This indicates a known error in the lineage. So you wanna check those notes carefully and see if it pertains to your family's line. FAMPCL, future applicants must prove correct lineage, is a little bit different than EL in that the lineage may actually be correct, but it needs to be documented. 
There are other codes, but these seem to be the ones that appear most often. But here's one final interesting code. If you see a real D, that indicates this member was actually the daughter of a patriot, a real daughter. So let's assume you found your ancestor in the ancestor database, and you'd like to have copies of the documents that a DAR member submitted. Using our Henry Rhodes example from earlier, let's assume you descend from Henry's son, David. If I click on this member's number, shown here as 650082, and then through a few screens alerting me to that error in the lineage warning, I'm gonna reach an opportunity to purchase the application, the supporting documentation, or both. You can preview the lineage. In this instance, we can preview this lineage and see how many generations match your own, remembering that the most recent generations are going to be redacted because they may be living individuals. Back to the online library document service page, you can note that there are 37 documents available if you purchase the supporting documentation, or of course, you could purchase both the application and the supporting documents. So what's in this application? When you purchase a DAR application, you can expect to learn information on the lineal descent from the Patriot ancestor, uh, copies of relevant sources that are in the supporting documents, information on the Patriot service and residence during the Revolutionary War, and possibly additional details of the Patriot and his or her family. In the supporting documents, there's a wide range of documents possible to find. This would include Bible records, wills, headstone images, um, all of the documents that were used to prove this family's lineage. But a word of caution here, not all documents found here will be considered genealogically acceptable by today's standards. Um, you will not see documents such as vital records for events that are less than 100 years old, because we take people's security, identity security very seriously. And I would strongly encourage women who are interested in joining DAR to connect with a registrar of their local DAR chapter, because a registrar can actually see the documents and let you know whether they're worth purchasing. So we've talked about the Ancestor database. There are two other databases I'd like to show you. From the main menu under GRS, let's take a quick look at the member database. This is really only helpful if you know a member's national number, as that is the only search term. If you do happen to know that, you're able to see that member's name. In this example, she's presumed, or, or she has notified, someone in her family has notified DAR that she is deceased. You can also see what chapter she joined and which ancestor she proved her descent from. But it's really the descendants database that I think researchers are gonna find most useful here. So again, from dar.org, and then selecting GRS for genealogical research system, you would select the descendants tab and you should see the screen. Just like with the ancestors tab, you'll wanna search by various spellings of your ancestors names. And if you wanna cast a wider net, enter only the information you are absolutely certain about. The descendants database is particularly helpful if you haven't confirmed a lineage all the way back to the revolutionary war era and someone has proven your ancestor who lived more recently. Again, you'll be limited to viewing only those records of people who are presumed deceased. You will not see more recent generations as those people will be assumed to still be living and we're protecting their identity. But from this list, you'll be able to click on the names uh, shown on the left here and you can see the lineage to the Patriot from uh, that descendant appears. So in our example, I was searching for Olive White and here she is as the daughter of our daughter-in-law, excuse me, of our Patriot, Samuel Adams. Again, notice that the generations that are presumed living are restricted from view, but I have very helpful genealogical information here on the older generations. Okay, let's turn to some of DAR's non-lineage resources within the GRC, uh, or Genealogical Records Committee. So this collection began over 100 years ago and includes documents that were not published at the time, including a wide range of historical records, uh, such as personal collections, transcribed headstones, much, much more. Members have invested hundreds of hours indexing all the volumes of this vast collection. You can search from all states or filter your search to a specific state from the drop-down menu. Remember when entering a surname, they weren't always standardized, so you wanna be creative and search for variations of that name. You can learn more about this collection by clicking GRC overview in the upper right as an example though, let's assume we're looking for information on Luke Stansberry from Maryland. In order to get the most results possible, I've selected Maryland from the drop-down menu and entered just Stansberry. 
Remember, I might want to come back and search Stansbury with multiple spellings. From the extensive list that came back, I may want to narrow my search by including Luke as a first name, depending what I'm looking for. From this list, I can see that the first three items are cemetery or tombstone inscriptions, and then a collection of Bible, church, and cemetery records. Notice the series and volume number followed by the page number. You want to make note of that if you think you'd like to purchase this page. You'll need those details to complete your order. So in this example, I want to note that the record is from Maryland in series one, volume 227, page 31A. And if you do find records you want to purchase, it's all done online through the DAR's library search service. So if you return to DAR.org and hover over the library tab, you'll find search services listed from this page. And you can order supporting documentation, photocopies of pages from a library book collection, copies from the GRC collection, all kinds of things. Um, there are instructions and contact information included on this web page. This is a lot of really good information, Allie. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know, is every Patriot already established in this database? I get asked this question a lot, and the answer is no. <laughs> uh, the database currently includes 150,000 Patriots. We add, on average, 20 Patriots every week, which is astonishing. <laughs> uh, but there are thousands of people who rendered aid to the colonists who are not yet honored in the database. And the biggest reason for that, uh, that they're not included in that database, is probably because they're only entered when a descendant joins DAR. So it's not as though someone's pouring over the um, muster rolls and adding all the names they can find. Someone actually has to become a member and prove the Patriot service for them to be included in the database. We have a number of internal initiatives to try and help potential members identify their Patriot ancestors and become members. One such effort is the Patriot Records Project, for which hundreds of DAR volunteers are indexing Revolutionary War documents that have been digitized by DAR. And these are available for the public to view, again, going to dar.org and selecting the GRS or Genealogical Research System, and then selecting the Rev War tab. From there, the Patriot Records Project Index which functions like all our other databases, only this time you can select the type of document you would like to search, or you can leave it to search all and have a larger list of responses, hopefully. And you can see there's a range of interesting documents that's returned. If you click on this blue question mark over here to the right, the icon, you'll see a description of the record, and most importantly, where the record is located so that you can inquire about getting a copy. So the more button in this example was a link to the National Archives. Another reason we're still adding to the database is that we're constantly expanding our awareness of who contributed what services that aided the colonists. We have a Spanish task force, for example, working to identify the residents of present day Southwestern US, but what was then Spain, because the King of Spain asked his subjects to give donations of cattle, supplies, and money to the colonists. The Spanish were key to the colonists' success. We also have a Jewish task force focused on patriots of Jewish ancestry, a French Patriot Task Force, and an emphasis on discovering more about African-American ancestry as well. There's a strong sense, a strong desire, excuse me, of our members to honor our Patriots of color, and researchers can search our relatively new database of names of individuals from a wide range of origins and backgrounds, including African, African-American, Native American, Latin American, and more. Again, this is from the GRS, and then the RevWar tab, and then select Patriots of color, and this database was built on the uh, Forgotten Patriots Research Guide, which is still available as a download, um, as a free PDF book. You've covered a lot of information about the DAR's physical and online public uh, resources. Um, but did you happen to mention earlier that there are actual volunteers who can help people with, with some of this? <laughs> Yes, yes, I did. So that would be the next resource I'd like to cover. Um, we have volunteers at the cha chapter, state, and national levels. Um, there are volunteer genealogists at all of those levels ready to assist prospective members with their lineage research and the whole application process. Most are extensively trained through courses they've taken through DAR, and all are eager to assist would-be members. At the national level, I've mentioned some of the resources of my team, the Lineage Research Committee, uh, including the Spanish Task Force, African American Ancestry, French Patriots, and Jewish Lineage. We also support several boots on the ground efforts, 
We have a full network of women willing to seek out documents from courthouses, cemeteries, other repositories um, through our Lineage Research Lookup Board and a dedicated Facebook group. And earlier this year, we launched a virtual support team. It provides assistance to any member working on a new member application by giving them personalized counseling sessions, either over Zoom or another meeting platform or over the phone. We're really working hard to leverage all of our knowledgeable members, members to train other members all over the country. All this to say, we have thousands of volunteers all across the country serving in a range of capacities, ready to help ladies become members. You mentioned earlier that the um, database of, of patriots doesn't have everyone listed. Um, but how would, if we discovered someone, for instance, in my own family, how would we go about getting uh, his service or her service established in your database? Great, great question. Thank you. So the key to providing and to proving a new patriot is not only proving the lineage, but also the residence and, of course, the service that he or she gave. This allows us to connect the claimed ancestor and the service and avoid assigning that service if, in fact, it was performed by another person of the same or similar name. So residence is key there. With very few exceptions, such as pensions, um, you can't prove the residence with the same documentation that you use to prove the service. So if you have proof of service for an individual who served on a jury, for example, you should prove from other sources generated during that time that the juror was the same person. So the residence has to be shown to be consistent with the life events for the individual. If you have an ancestor who was born in or died in one state, but their residence and service are in another state, you're gonna to have to prove uh, that that could be them, that you have to provide acceptable documentation to show that individual moved from the state they were born in to the state they served and then to where they died. Um, let's assume that my mother or my niece um, think that they have found a Revolutionary War ancestor in our own family. Um, mm -hmm. How did they actually join the DAR? Ah. So the best place to start is with a local chapter. Um, again, dar.org. From this site, you can click uh, to learn more and use this, or you can use the search function and enter the word join. And you'll be directed to the become a member page where you can learn all about how to begin the process, um, where a chapter is near you. Um, you can also complete this membership interest form and that will be forwarded to the state or country a membership chair. And you'll be contacted by a volunteer who's ready and able to help. There are more than 3,000 chapters across the U.S. and in 12 other countries, and we are always delighted to welcome new members. We've covered a lot of information and a lot of material, a lot of really helpful uh, information. At this time, I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. If we, if we have any, uh, please uh, type them in and we'll be happy to take them. Um, and I see one that's already come through from Allie Meeker. Um, if we believe we have multiple ancestors that serve, how should we approach choosing a line for application? Ah, good question. So the person that you work with, typically your chapter registrar, they're going to want to pick the easiest path. So we have a means by which we can access the database and see which ancestors have already been proven and how much of your line matches a proven member's line. And that's the one we'll want to pick. But then you can come back later date and prove as many ancestors as you can um, on your own methods. So um, Stephen mentioned at the beginning, I've proven 30 of my own. It's taken me quite a long time. I have a bucket more to do. I'm dying to get my first female patriot, but we're going to want to pick the one uh, to join through that's the easiest line. And a, a registrar can do that for you. They can see match your lineage with something that's uh, in the proven database. Very interesting. Um, we've got a question in from Sarah Pitcher. Um, I'm washing from North Dakota. I joined in the 1980s, but due to circumstances beyond my control, I needed to stop going. I would like direction on how to reinstate my belonging to the organization. Please and thank you. Fantastic. We would love to have you back. Um, if you just contact your local chapter um, and they can get you set up with a reinstatement form, it's a nominal fee, and then it'll be the current year's dues um, to the uh, chapter, state, and national society. And we welcome you with open arms. Uh, Mark Herbert asks, is there a searchable function on the DAR website we can use to find ancestors who may already be there? Yes. So that was in that whole DRS under the ancestors tab. Again, you want to be careful about um, being too specific when you look to use different search terms. So I recommend just a last name. If, it, if it's Smith, you're going to need to add a first name. But if you have an unusual last name in the family, um, you'll find your ancestor there. But 
do, try multiple spellings. Um, I had, was just working on an application this morning. Family thought the name was Tub. It's Tubs. It gets changed over the generations. So um, cast a wide net. Uh, there are you have to search at least by one field, right? So you typically a last name, but it's in that GRS database under the Ancestors tab. Elizabeth Boardman, um, I have an east, I have an east of who in a sworn statement available on fold three about an application for someone else stated he served a few times in the RU militia and another statement that he, that package said that he would, had been in the militia. Would this be enough for him to be listed as a patriot, not currently listed? So tough to evaluate out of context. Um, and I think that's the same answer that a reviewing genealogist would tell you as well. Like we need the whole picture. Um, so a couple of things I would say about that. Yes, you're off to a good start. You've got some, it sounds like you have some documentation that this person served. Um, I would continue to seek out additional documentation and then remember that you really need to prove the residency. So make sure that this is your ancestor, not someone of a same name. Um, so proving where this person lived. Um, but it's, it's hard to say with it, without the full context of all the other documentation that you would have, including the lineage, um, if that was enough to have this person listed as a patriot. Uh, Kathleen uh, says, where do I begin? I've already seen that my patriot ancestor is registered on your site. Ah, great. So thank you for visiting the site already. Um, I would start with a local chapter. Uh, you can find that also on the DAR website. You can either just search uh, the word join and it'll direct you to the uh, becoming a member page and um, find a, a chapter near you or you can submit that membership interest form and that'll get sent to um, your state. Um, that's the best place to start because a, a chapter registrar is going to have access to a wide range of documents that the public can't see uh, and she'll really be able to help you with the whole proving the lineage. Um, but that's the best place to start is get in touch with a local chapter. Hazel asks, if you're an organizing member and you pass away, what happens to your membership? I'm not sure I understand the question as far as being an organizing member, um, but if you pass away, um, you aren't paying dues anymore, so your membership lapses. Um, there are many things that we try to do to encourage the children and grandchildren of those who pass to become members. We have a new program, in fact, called the Legacy Project, um, in which uh, daughters of women who've joined or grandmothers who've joined can prove all of their uh, family's ancestors for a much lower fee than it used to be, um, that your membership lapses at your death. So we don't um, keep deceased on the membership rolls. Linda asks, uh, you mentioned MOB. How do you obtain information on the back of the card? Yep, again, those are from our pre-digital days. So most of that's gonna be in the comments section on the ancestors record. Um, if it isn't there and it's something that you feel you need to see, um, really good question. Again, I would get in touch with a, a local chapter and see if the registrar can put in a question. Um, somebody might be able to ask the uh, staff at DAR, but but no, I don't want you to write staff at DAR because they are inundated with questions like this. Uh, I think for the most part, you're gonna find that answer in the comments section on the ancestors record. Uh, Mary Francis asks, how do I become a volunteer genealogist? I am a professional genealogist. Ah, fantastic. So um, first step is to make sure you're a member. Um, so if you are a member of DAR, fantastic. Um, we would love to have your services. Um, and then uh, each state is a little bit different. Um, some chapters and states really want people to go, have gone through the DAR classes uh, to become either a chair of the volunteer genealogy um, committee or a chapter registrar. Some chapters sponsor that, um, other chapters don't have those requirements. It, it varies by chapter, it varies by state, but um, there are no requirements to become a volunteer genealogist, just the uh, desire to work with prospective members, a little bit of know-how, and if you're already a professional genealogist, you probably have all of that already, so come on board. Okay, Karen asks, I have solid proof of my family ancestor, yet someone's tried to tell me that it wasn't true. How do I appeal? Was I, okay, so I don't know who the someone is. Um, someone said it wasn't. So there are issues with some uh, types of proof. So for example, there was a huge run in the 1920s for everybody to 
publish a family genealogy book. No citations, no proof, just get your family genealogy book out there and everyone descended from William the Conqueror, what do you know? Um, and we call them mug books. And sometimes those aren't so valid. Um, if it's based on that kind of a record, um, there, there could be other reasons why your documentation was considered not valid, but um, there's often other ways around. So go around, not through that brick wall, right? Let's find a way. Um, I think I wouldn't continue to try to use that documentation, whatever that was. I'm not sure who the someone is that's telling you it's not true, but uh, let's assume that it's um, someone at the DAR reviewing genealogy staff. They know what they're talking about. And um, hopefully they give you a reason. Um, like I said, the first thing that comes to my mind are those mug books that aren't very reliable. Um, I know in my own family, I found and um, thought I had all these patriots and they were all bogus. So um, it could be disappointing to learn that. But um, the other thing I'll say is my, my birds of a feather theory. So I have this theory that these people had a, a radical idea. They were gonna overthrow the British government, right? And so they tended to flock with people of like mind. So if you have one ancestor who in one way or another supported the cause, you probably have more than one. So maybe find another patriot uh, and find a pathway to that. Probably person. not not too far off from where that uh, that line that you're, you're already looking at, too. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the first thing I do when people ask me about supplementals. I look at the patriot. OK, who was he or she married to and what did their parents do? Because those people flocked together. And um, it was, you know, it's a crazy idea to overthrow the government at the time. Right. <laughs> so. OK, Stephanie's asking, what if you find a possible error in the database regarding a lineage? My ancestor, William Romans, and his son, William Romans Jr., might have been conflated and collapsed as one person. Ah. And I guess that they're talking about the DAR website. Is that where you're where they're seeing that? Maybe I'm going to um, assume that it's the um, database that, the, that they believe they've discovered an error in the database. Um, and I'm not going to say it doesn't happen. Um, you know, we, we are um, stricter today's standards than we were 50 years ago, for sure. Uh, and it's a lot easier to be stricter because a lot more things are available online. Um, the best way to prove that is to uh, either join through that line, join DR, or have a supplemental proven through that line. So you'll want solid documentation about who's who. Um, it happens a lot uh, in every family we have. You know, it's James and Thomas and William, and they have James and Thomas and William, <laughs> and, then, and the names just repeat, and it can be really frustrating. Um, so one of the things they teach you in a DAR uh, genealogy course, in fact, is teasing out five men of the same name in the same county born at about the same time. How do you discover who's really who and which one is your patriot ancestor? So, uh, but the best way to correct any kind of an error that you think might exist uh, is to join DAR through that line or to, um, if you already are a member, to do a supplemental through that line. Okay, we've got another question. Um, I can trace my ancestry back to a patriot as a captain in the Bucks County, Pennsylvania militia, uh, then the regular Continental Army. Can my now fiance join the DAR? So if I understand the, correct, the question correctly, you descend from a patriot, but your fiance does not. So um, this is direct lineal descent. So um, the fiance needs to descend from the patriot ancestor. Um, we don't do, we call it collateral. If it's um, marriage anywhere in the line or not direct, um, you to join DAR, it has to be a direct lineal uh, patriot ancestor. And that's true for most of the lineage societies that I'm aware of. Um, I'm not aware of very many. I only know of one I can think of off the top of my head that accepts collateral ancestors. Um, but for DAR, it needs to be a direct line. Okay. Um, do you have an auxiliary for men um, where the female wife is not interested in genealogy, but she is the descendant of the patriot? Ah. That's sort of the same question we just had. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> interesting sidebar, um, Hodars, husbands of DARs. <laughs> um, some of them, I mean, they're, they're extremely helpful. Many of us would not be able to do much of the work that we do without our Hodars. It's kind of the only auxiliary I can think of. Um, but uh, if it's your the woman that descends from the Patriot, we don't have a way for you as a male to be uh, to take part. If you as a male have a Patriot, there is a Sons of the American Revolution that you can join. And you'd have your own uh, genealogy and patriotic service organization. All right. Another question. Do you share and update data with the Sons of the American Revolution? 
can we share an update? Um, so we work very closely with them. We do a lot um, at the ground level, parades and that kind of thing. A lot of DAR women help a lot of men and their families become members of Sons of the American Revolution. As far as um, database information, I believe those are separate entities. I could be wrong here, but I don't think there's any sharing and updating of data. What if I can see the connection of the family but can't find his birth certificate to prove? Options? Yeah, especially when you get back to uh, an era before vital records were generated, you're not going to have a birth certificate, right? So there are a number of other acceptable uh, proof documentation. So a Bible record or a will or a land deed. People forget about the land deeds and the land deeds are usually so beautiful in naming who the children were. Um, if there was any contesting of a will and the kids fight one another. They have to say their relationship to the deceased. Um, I'm with caution, I will say published family genealogies, but they need to be very well cited. And if they're that well cited, you should probably just go for the original citation. Um, there are other things. And again, a chapter registrar can help you determine what is likely to be accepted. Uh, only a reviewing genealogist at DAR can have the final say, but a chapter registrar should be able to help guide you. How could Quaker ancestors have served? Ah, so most of them didn't serve in the way we mean that. They didn't pick up muskets. But as I mentioned earlier, many of them owned land and they paid a supply tax. And the supply tax, so for example, in Virginia, it was in 1783. You paid your taxes because you owed land. Well, that tax went to fund the army. And we recognize that as having supported the cause. So thank you very much for your service. My own daughter-in-law joined through her Quaker family who uh, did exactly that. They paid the supply tax on land they owned. Quakers could very easily probably have given beef to the army or grain, uh, things like that. And if you can prove it, and a lot of times you can easily find this in, in surviving records, that could also work. Uh, for, Absolutely. For, yep. For there are all kinds of material aid that could be rendered that consider, we consider supporting the cause. So it doesn't necessarily mean you picked up a musket and fought. Uh, it means you supported cause in one way or another. You were there to assist the colonists. So. Mm -hmm. Curiosity of how DAR supports its members in this day and age. Um, supports our members. So um, I was mentioning that one of the membership benefits, um, a lot of the things I tell young women are leadership opportunities. We have a lot of um, opportunities for leadership development at the chapter level, at the state level, at the national level. Um, the other way we support is just by forming a camaraderie, um, trying to become more and more diverse as far as all traditional forms of diversity like race. But we have a wide range. My own chapter, we have women from 18 to 90 years old. And we each bring very unique backgrounds. Some of us are working moms. Some of us are stay-at-home moms. Some of us are in college still. Um, all of that helps support one another, um, especially uh, lately, we've been all meeting via Zoom, and it helps to have that connection. Um, we've been trying to take care of our older members. Uh, last year, we had a couple of our members make masks for all of our older members, go visit them at their nursing homes and that kind of thing. So there's a lot of ways each chapter is going to be unique. Each chapter has its own personalities and initiatives that they take on to help support their members. But um, certainly that's something that we um, take a lot of pride in doing and we're um, committed to doing is to serve our members. Do we have another question? Okay. Um, I have the name of my ancestor who served in the American Revolution and have a direct link back, to, uh, have the direct link back to me. Um, how do I become a member? So number one, contact a local chapter. Um, and I think I still have the chapter page showing on the screen. So um, there are over 3000 chapters in the US and in 12 other countries. Um, so if you live somewhere very remotely and you don't have a local chapter near you, you can join as a member at large you would then miss out on a lot of the membership benefits of um, being involved with a chapter. So I'd strongly encourage that you try and find a chapter and a chapter registrar will walk you through the application. Um, it's a four page legal document. I would never hand that to someone and ask them to fill it out. There are specific nomenclature that we use. So a registrar or a membership chair, or some other member of a chapter will help you um, and will help uh, you to um, determine whether or not you, we think that the proofs that you're using are going to be acceptable. And um, that's the best way to become a member. Let's 
see if we've got another question coming in. Okay. Maybe we don't have any more. I can't help but see over here in the in the chatter that someone says they, they found out that Martha Washington is their seventh great grandmother. I love it. Very How fun is that, right? Uh, we yeah. we try to do we try to track you know her descendants is you know we know who most of them are. She only had one child from whom she had descendants, and there were four grandchildren, and from there it goes. But she has a lot of descendants. Um, well, this whole genealogy hobby gets really addicting really fast. I'm the first member of my family to join DAR after being told for years and years and years that I descended from Samuel Adams. The Samuel Adams in my example is my ancestor. And it's not the Samuel Adams, but as a cousin of. <laughs> and in my family, we were all told it was the Samuel Adams. He doesn't have any descendants. So. All right, we've got a question that just came in. Um, so you have to join a specific chapter or can you pick from any local? You don't have to uh, be, it doesn't have to be a local chapter. So we have several members in our chapter that are relatives of our members and they live out of state. Um, but you have to join through, it, it's best to join through a chapter. That way you'll get some assistance from a chapter registrar. You could, as I mentioned, join as a member at large, um, but you'd be missing out on so much. I don't, I don't know why you would do that. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I, I would strongly encourage you to join through a chapter um, to gain all the benefits of being a member and, and the camaraderie and, uh, support of other women. But um, if you don't live near a chapter, you could join uh, as a member at large. It probably depends on where you are. I know here in the town of Alexandria, which is very close to Mount Vernon, there's probably 10 chapters in this town. Uh, yeah. And in DC, there's a lot more than that. But maybe yeah. you live in a small town out in somewhere that there's only one, maybe in the, exactly. in the whole county. Um, so it depends on where you are, I'm sure. Exactly. <laughs> Um, okay, Kath Catherine is asking, is marriage for each generation a requirement in proving ancestry? Some individuals claim they were denied membership because there was no marriage at one generation. Nope, that's not true. <laughs> um, so we don't require proof of marriage. In fact, many my, I have ancestors who weren't married before they had the, the child. What we want to make sure of is that we are we don't have an issue of one and the same. So in other words, we want to make sure that the person you claim was born to these two people and married this one person is the same person, not a person of the same name. So we don't require marriage uh, or proof of marriage. It is often a helpful document because marriage certificates typically name the parents. So it helps us to confirm this is the same Sally Smith born to these people who marries Joe whoever. Um, but it's not a requirement and certainly nobody would be denied membership um, for that. Um, I, I have a hunch it was probably something else. Um, we call into question if a marriage, so as an example from my family, the marriage happened, in, I guess in Tennessee, you got married when the preacher could come around and you were accepted as married if you said you were married. So my ancestors had children and two or three years later, the preacher finally came around to their town and officially married them. So I had to then prove that they really were the biological parents of my, who I said they were. Um, luckily, um, a pension was uh, pension was filed, and it had to name and, and my great great whatever great grandmother said, I had these children before marrying, but these this is the father. So it gets tricky. I, I'm thinking that might be the situation that um, there was an issue about biological parentage, but you don't have to prove marriage in order to um, to to prove the lineage. You might you might run into a situation, for instance, a courthouse is burned. And there is no proof of that marriage. Exactly. It's not to say it didn't happen. It, Correct. The, the, the record is destroyed. And Correct. particularly in those earlier generations, not long after the revolution, it, 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 it maybe never got recorded anyway. Yep. Um, depending on yeah. where these people lived, you know, it was. And, and so um, the key is just, you know, the, the difficulty becomes um, proving the woman's maiden name because we don't have a marriage document. How do we know that she is who we say she is? So. I have a hunch that the, the denial is something a little bit more complicated than not having a marriage certificate. Okay, we've got another question. If I have documentation of an ancestor being a member of the DAR, would I just need to prove direct lineage to that DAR member? It depends how long ago she joined. So if this was you know, your great-great-grandmother, the standards have changed a lot. So you're gonna have to possibly update that application to meet today's standards. Um, and you'd have to fill in blank. So a lot of people would have died since your great, great grandmother. So you would need to provide documentation of those events. Um, in a lot of cases, if it's someone who joined 
fairly recently, it's going to be very simple to just provide your birth certificate, um, the documents that connect you and whatever generations in, in recent years. But I, it, I hesitate to answer that completely because it depends how old the application is. I'm close to proving my genealogy, but I'm hitting a bump and need a birth certificate from Puerto Rico. Many records were lost in past hurricanes. Any tips? Yikes. <laughs> um, so birth certificates from overseas are tricky. Um, I don't have a tip for that, but I have, I have a, like a workaround. So my workaround would be um, you might not need the birth certificate. So let's say it was a, a recent generation. If it's your parent, um, you can write a statement of, of explanation that just says, look, if your parent's still alive, even they could say, look, this is where I was born. Records gone from hurricanes. I am who I say I am. And, and maybe there's a school record or a uh, social security application or some other document that helps us to confirm the identity. But DAR is, is not completely inflexible. You know, um, they will work with you. Um, I've had situations where um, a record could not be provided. Death records get lost. Um, things happen, you know, and there are, there are sometimes things we can use. So if it's an older generation, um, death records gone, it should be available. Say they died in 1942. Let's use the 1940 census to show when they were last alive then and write a letter of explanation saying why the death certificate couldn't be found or um, a letter from the agency. So in this case, it would be from Puerto Rico saying there's no death certificate here. It got lost. Um, that, that will be accepted and we can use something in lieu of this birth certificate. I would suggest also um, in a place like Puerto Rico that has a heavy Hispanic population, i.e. Roman Catholic, um, that there could be uh, surviving church baptismal records, that sort of thing uh, in Puerto Rico that, that might be able to help you with that. I've, the, the Roman Catholic records I've ever looked at are very descriptive and have got, you know, they list a lot of good information, including who the parents are. Absolutely. Um, and that, that would be a suggestion um, to, for that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the tricks is to just kind of go around these brick walls. If you can't get through the brick wall, go around it, find a, find a workaround. <laughs> Okay, are there ways to identify possible patriots who could be European volunteers that help the cause? Example, uh, ar arrived or worked on ships or Navy? Yes, so, and I mentioned some of the uh, task forces that we have in place. So um, we have a French task force and the Jewish task force and Spanish task force and African-American research and um, lineage research, all of this. So um, there are, it's um, again, tricky because you have to prove residence. So um, we have a whole bunch of patriots from France, for example, that they, they helped uh, support the cause. Um, Spanish patriots, I mentioned, and we're constantly trying to add that to our database and find their descendants because they're all eligible. Um, you'll, you'll need some assistance. So uh, you, you, know, you got to prove the service, prove the residency and prove the lineage. So Again, connect with a local chapter and find a chapter registrar who can help you. And then that person can reach out to us at the national level where we have um, folks in the lineage committee, lineage research committee that can help. I'll say on, on that topic, I've looked at French records before um, and uh, they, they've got really good records there. I mean, a lot of these people, shiploads of people came over and served and they went back to France. They, right. they never stayed yep. here, um, yep. but yet they served. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And there, there are good records on this stuff in, in these yeah. foreign countries. You just have to know how to get to it through the various archives in the in those countries. Absolutely. Um, okay, here's a good question. What about adopted children? If my son adopts his stepdaughters, would those girls be able to join under me? I'm very sorry, but it is um, bloodline. So lineal descent, bloodline. And, um, and I do hate that because I know that there are many, many women who have adopted children and would love to join. Um, but unfortunately it is by bloodline. And um, if we could find the lineage of the stepdaughters, we might be able to find a path back, but unfortunately you know, they can't join through your line. Okay. Do you have any other questions? Not, not seeing any, um, but we're, we're pretty much getting right up close to our to our hour. Um, this has been fascinating. Um, we've covered a lot of really good information um, and, and I want to thank the audience for giving us so many uh, really interesting and, and relevant questions. Um, uh, 
I will um, again uh, suggest that everybody uh, please have a, a good look around the Mount Vernon website. I know we've got a lot of people from DAR in tonight that you may not uh, be as familiar with who we are um, as an institution at Mount Vernon, but we welcome you to, to check out our website, see all of our interesting book talks that we're doing or symposia, the lecture series uh, that we're doing both virtually and in person. Um, and we hope you'll come and visit us at some point. And um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for having me, Stephen. I appreciate well, thank it. Thank you, Allie. This has been, been great fun. Great. Thank you. All right. Good night, everybody.